This week's been a very odd week. I've kind of been here, there, everywhere. Monday morning, I started off in London because I had to have a meeting and the meeting was pretty boring. But what was interesting is Christmas has hit London. Now, if you've never been to London, well, I'm the wrong person to give you advice on where to go, what to see, all the touristy stuff, because I've never done any of it. But what I can tell you is all of the underground car parks where all the supercars are kept, every single house that has a 918 Spider, a McLaren F1 in the garage, I can tell you every single unmodernized Muse house. Now, if you don't know what a Muse house is, they are the old stable slash house servant houses that go behind all of these massive F you I'm rich seven story terrace houses that you get in Chelsea Knightsbridge they're unbelievable it's really something you should see I'll put on the screen the main postcodes that I recommend you going to visit to see houses but I almost pay no attention to the big houses it's these muse houses that I cannot believe because almost all of them are now fully London developed and they've been transformed into iceberg homes if you don't know what an iceberg home is well that means there's more more underground than above ground. Some of these places have five, six basements because you used to be allowed to get crazy planning. They essentially would let you dig down to the core of the earth and put four or five floors in. And that led to some pretty horrific events happening where there were certain structural issues. And I think this person in particular, the house next door was owned in a shell corporation. So all offshore Cayman Island things and the damage created all of the water, the flooding, the insurance pale, none of that stuff went through because the Shell Corporation just kept jumping around. And there's so much dodginess in London when it comes to money. I mean, if you've ever been into Harrods, you are going to see some things that you've never seen before. For example, a 25 year old woman opening up a handbag and there's probably, this is a complete guess, but I would say she had the best part of £250,000 worth of cash in her handbag the money laundering in harrods i don't know how it's allowed i really don't i also bought a bottle of water from harrods food hall and that was just standard price but the person in front of me spent 380 quid on a bag of food. Also, I know somebody who used to work at Harrods and they have a service that nobody really knows about where if you call them up and you say, okay, I want a private island for a birthday that's happening in two days. I need you to organize all of the private jets, all of the pickup drop-offs. And then I also want there to be a super yacht moored off of the island. Harrods has a service that fulfills all of that stuff. Now I love cars, but I've never been somewhere where a Ferrari SF90 or an 812, a Lamborghini, Rolls Royce Cullinans, Range Rovers are just standard. You see them as often as taxis. And the crazy thing is when you walk away from like the Sloan Street, the main proper areas in Mayfair, and you get onto these back streets and you get a little glimpse into the residential life of the people who are living there. When you see a house that's 10 million quid, You've also got to remember that these people do not put IKEA furniture in their houses. They put in the most over the top priced furniture. I've always had a fascination with money and how it all works and then rich people specifically because to me, I'm well, you lot know, I'm a very cheap person. I don't like spending money, but seriously, the money in these houses. I mean, I know of people who have Picasso's, Rembrandt's, all of these mad art collections just on the walls of their houses. And obviously they've got crazy security. Like this one person I know of, he's got 24 hour sit-in security in his Muse house. Meaning he's got an employee on 50 grand a year to just sit in his garage and watch all of his security cameras. Honestly, it is actually a little bit sickening, the money in London. But if you're someone like me who loves houses and cars, you genuinely cannot find a better place because, well, it's got all of that. Now back to the tiny house, massive update. I have now ordered the skylight windows. They're skylights like normal ones that go on a flat roof, but they are what I'm gonna be using for windows, which if you haven't watched the previous videos, it's a weird idea, which I saw on a multi-million pound chalet in Verbier when I was walking down the high street and I saw a new build and I was like, they are just standard skylights that they're installing 
as windows. I've never seen that before. Now I forgot about it for about five months. And then a few weeks ago when I was recording a video, I suddenly remembered that and I thought, wait, why don't I just try that for the tiny house project? And the reason why I kind of didn't want to do it is because I don't fully understand how it's actually possible. I keep thinking that the skylight will somehow fall out of the window. But the thing is, is when you use a lot of silicon, it creates a vacuum. And when it's on a perimeter of a two meter 20 by 80 centimeter pane of glass well that's a lot of surface area and if i know my physics which i don't because i did physics at a level and i got a u redid it again got a u redid it again and got an e and that is progress which i had to explain in every single interview when i was applying for jobs in finance i mean going back a year at school is hard enough to explain and the way that i chose to explain it was to not explain it. I mean, my CV is incredible. Not because there's anything good on it. I mean, my grades were awful. I got exactly the lowest UCAS or UMS points. I can't remember what it is. I think you needed 98 UMS points to get onto an apprenticeship scheme in finance. And I had 98. And if you've ever applied for a job in finance, well, everybody and their dog wants those jobs. So you're up against a load of other candidates and me. Well, I still can't believe I even managed to get a job. I just never gave up. I kept getting rejections from here, there, everywhere. I even got rejected from super small companies that were just like 20 employees. They all said no to me. And then eventually one day, a particular company went, yeah, come back for a second interview, come back for a third interview. And then I eventually ended up getting getting a job in finance at the age of, what was I, 17 or 18 years old, which at the time I was really proud of. And the thing that I'm also extremely proud of, which I still can't honestly believe, is nobody ever checked up what I wrote on my CV. And that was that I had experience working for Have Some Vision properties, which did not exist at that time which is funny now that it does exist like that's how much i believed in myself but also i've got to pat myself on the back to walk into interviews in FTSE 100 companies and mike ross the absolute crap out of every single interview honestly it's hilarious and the fact that all of these people that i worked with went to oxford cambridge they went to eton they're trust funded to the absolute hill and then they're sat next to me who was a laborer and now i'm earning exactly the same money as them and then the funniest aspect of it all is when they all found out that i was earning more money outside of work and i've done a separate video on that on how two people that i worked with tried to get me fired because they were extremely jealous of what i was achieving outside of my day job and actually on that that's the sort of thing that i kind of want to talk about in a sort of podcast fashion and Substack, which is where I post my weekly newsletter, there's actually a podcast function on it. And Substack, I own the platform, therefore meaning I can say whatever I want, which is a very dangerous thing. How did I even get onto this topic? Oh, it's probably because I've just been back in London and in meetings, and then that's reminded me of my day job and just how much I hated being an employee in a corporate job, getting on the tube when it's dark and then leaving the office when it's dark. I hated it. Anyway, the skylights, they're arriving soon. £1,600 I spent, so 400 quid per skylight. Remember, buy them on eBay. I got a discount because I was buying four. And a key, key thing to remember is I'll chuck on the screen right now. Always remember to check the measurements because sometimes they can be very misleading with the sizes. For example, on this particular skylight, the measurement is the internal dimensions and then you need to add the perimeter part of glass in comparison to the skylights that are on the roof where the measurements were actually the outside pane of glass and then you had to minus off the perimeter to get the internal area which creates the opening. Now, another thing, if you're thinking about doing skylight windows, you've also got to remember the upstand and the upstand I'm gonna be using, I think is going to be a six by two, which I will probably taper at a 80 degree angle. Now, if you don't know what angle of repose is, it's basically if you dropped a load of sugar on your table in a mound, that angle of the sloping of the sugar or flour, sand, whatever you're using to the horizontal plane, like the table or the floor, that is the steepest angle of which the material can be piled without it slumping, like sliding down a slope. Now that kind of sounds like I know what I'm talking about, but I really don't because I'm not using sand 
I'm using glass, which is sand, but melted. But I think that does still apply, doesn't it? Because obviously there's a point in which when you angle a pane of glass that it will fall into itself instead of out. I think if I put the glass at like an 87 degree angle or something, that might offer a little bit of support to prevent it ever falling out, even though there's a huge vacuum effect that's going to be happening when the silicon is attached to the glass and the upstand. And what that's going to allow me to do is jut the window out past the cladding system that I'm going to use. And I think it's going to create a super cool effect because you've got these perimeter black pieces of glass like you would get on, say, a Sunseeker or a Super Yacht. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe if you're new and sign up to my weekly newsletter. I am honestly enjoying so much what that is growing into. And I've got so many ideas and suggestions from you lot of what to include in it. So go check it out. And as always, I will see you next Thursday.